name is Nia Overstreet. It's a pleasure to see you all. I hope you're all having a beautiful day. Today, I will be doing my next community garden tour at Growing Hope's Garden in Santa Monica on Virginia Avenue. With this tour, I am adding extra emphasis on why it is very important to grow your own food, number one, for community residents, and number two, connecting homeless individuals to fresh, healthy, free food so that everyone can get the best quality for their mind, body, and soul. And they do not have to eat food that is pumped with herb herbicides, pesticides, and chemicals. Because at the end of the day, do you really know what's going on in your body? And I'm very excited to be talking to the founder and executive directive of the garden, as well as a manager who oversees 12 other gardens in the city of Los Angeles. And I also will be interviewing the intern that works there. And yeah, it is very exciting. And let's dive straight into the video. Please make sure you subscribe, like, and comment. And I am very excited to be getting the brochures out to the homeless community. Gardens, and I am. Good morning, I'm Hilo, the garden manager for Goron Hope Gardens, and, and welcome. So, uh, Grow Home Garden's mission is to empower people to grow their own food at in shelters, affordable housing buildings, and bacon lots throughout Los Angeles. And we are in Santa Monica today. This is a quarter acre bacon lot that was let us, that's been lent to us for the next 15 years. Yes, 15 years. It's really unheard of in Santa Monica, but the landlord is a nonprofit and they're in the affordable housing business. And this is a lot they're not going to be using for a while. So rather than just letting it be there and do nothing, we're, we turned it into a community garden. We've been here for a year and a half. And when we came here, this lot uh, was full of trash, furniture, and just things that were unsightly. And thanks to the, the wonderful support of the local community, uh, friends of us, and, and just people who want to see projects like this succeed, Look at what we have as of now. Hi, I'm Carolyn Day. I'm the founder and executive director of Growing Hope Gardens. We lead food gardens with folks uh, from underserved communities, low-income communities, where they live. And this is a quarter-acre farm between two affordable housing communities that can both access it directly from their properties and um, share in food growing and harvesting, preparing and uh, tending to the bunnies. We receive 300 volunteers a year that last year was our first year and um, we engaged about 350 residents and their families perfect perfect and briefly can you explain uh, what this garden does for homeless individuals or for individuals who do not have uh, a lot of income uh, we have a work development program where we have uh, unhoused individual who are stipend to water the gardens at the local homeless shelters and um, come visit our farm and work here a little bit. We also have uh, programs with the recently uh, housed and where they live, where they can become garden ambassadors, paid garden ambassadors to tend to the resident food gardens there. So it's all about empowering people to connect to the food they eat to their own health, to their communities, to then their well-being. Perfect, perfect. And lastly, can you tell me what's your favorite thing about this garden in specific? Do you have a favorite plant or? Oh, my favorite thing is uh, coming off of the sidewalk, feeling like you're in a city and you turn this corner and all of a sudden you look up and there's giant sunflowers growing and 25 fruit trees and butterflies It just, it feels like an oasis in the city. That's my favorite thing about the farm. That's amazing. Thank you so much, Carolyn. Everyone come and support. Oh, and we also have weekly produce donations at the farm. We donate a thousand uh, pounds of plant-based produce and protein every Wednesday. Between one and two.
So as you enter the garden, on your left hand side, we have a rabbit hutch. And it's become one of the more popular attractions, especially for children. It's only been here for maybe six months. And um, uh, you just never thought of having rabbits, right? But someone said, uh, would you like to take over these rabbits? I can no longer keep them. And so I said, sure, why not? And uh, it's just one of those, those happy accidents that we built a rabbit hutch. And we have two rabbits, uh, Tom, Smokey and Bandit. Uh, the Bandit is the white one with black uh, the surrounding in his eyes. And Smokey is the darker one. And they're both brothers. They're both brothers from the same litter. <sighs> And so this is this is our little rabbit run. We are in the process of basically extending it because it's become so popular. Mm -hmm. We have a, so every day, just about every day, we have school children that kind of literally run to sometimes to, to say, "Oh, how's Smokey? And how's um, how's Bandit doing?" Right? And so you know, if, if they don't have pets, or maybe it's just not convenient for them to have rabbits as pets, right? This just becomes this wonderful thing because in their own in their own backyard they have a rabbit hutch they come in i let them come in one at a time and just kind of hang out in there and they'll feed the rabbits uh kale or any greens from the garden and it's just you know when you're a you're an eight-year-old kid right just have just being around rabbits and other pets it's just it's like a wonderful experience i think and then sometimes you see them like here, here's bandit hey bandit Oh, and here's his brother, right? They're, so right now they're just lounge. At least um, one of them is lounging. So they all go through these periods where they'll chase each other, yeah. and then children get like, "Oh my God, they're chasing each other!" Right? <laughs> <laughs> and so it's just one of those little wonderful things that you know a 12-year-old should enjoy after yeah. school. I think. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Or actually, younger. <laughs> yeah. As we so as we come down further, we were gifted two coffee bean trees bushes, I should say. Coffee doesn't really do well in like uh, in this area, but these particular ones have acclimated okay. and seem to be doing quite well actually. Okay. Uh, we might see a coffee bean or two still, but uh, let me see. Not, not. They're all gone. So if you're not familiar, oh, look at this. There's the last two coffee beans, right? That's beautiful. So these berries, I'm gonna take one out, right? So, so when it's in full and it's like peak of the season, we generally get about a pound or two as of now from mm -hmm. one bush. Mm -hmm. And so this, here's the coffee bean berry. The berry itself is soft, almost like a cranberry. Well, um, we try to have plants that are culturally, uh, uh, you know, appropriate for the, our residents. Mm -hmm. A lot of our residents here are from Hispanic descent mm -hmm. in other cultures. And so we, so Nopales tends to be one of the popular ones. This is a, a tree that produces a pot. They have sort of like a bean-like pot. So this, so you know, so this, this, this is actually produces a bean pot that's actually edible and food. We try to make sure that 90% of what we grow here is edible in one way or the other. Um, Nopales, our um, loqua tree. We have also a grape back here. They're so beautiful. And, oh yeah, and look, and as you can see, so this is its first year. But just look at the abundance of grapes yeah. we're gonna we're gonna see. So I I, I I I figure that maybe in about a month and a half, come mm -hmm. September, October, they'll mm -hmm. be fully ripened, and so people will come over here and grab a small little bundle of grapes. You know? Yeah. There's a, I, I, there's at least maybe fifty or so small bundles. So mm -hmm. so that means that fifty residents. Have, will have the opportunity to come out here mm -hmm. and harvest their own grapes. Yeah. Isn't that wonderful? So what do you guys do to make it so bountiful, make it so plump? So everything begins with the soil. Okay. If we, if we have a healthy soil, you'll most likely will have a bountiful crop. Okay. So actually when we first arrived here, we did, the first thing we did wasn't to, you know, was, was just to basically clean up the, the, the the spot mm -hmm. but also to feed the soil oh. we had 10 truckloads of mulch and mulch is this is what we call mulch mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. a material like this mm -hmm. and we spread it all throughout the um the property mm -hmm. so mulch over time 
will decompose from the bottom up. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, it's activating all the microbes in the soil, bringing the soil, the dormant soil back to life. Mm -hmm. So when you have healthy soil, mm -hmm. and which is, this is what we did first of all, is just basically feed the soil and awaken mm -hmm. all that life that was already mm -hmm. there. Mm -hmm. Hence, having this. Mm -hmm. Healthy soil leads to bountiful crops. Yeah. That's amazing. We also do like, you know, so from here we have rue. Mm -hmm. rosemary so like i said we want to make sure that at least 90 percent what we have is edible mm -hmm. so rue it's used for teas it's used for meats in mm -hmm. certain cultures rosemary we're obviously familiar with mm -hmm. although the, this is the 21st century and right. we, we're no longer cooking our food in pits with our right right there is that sort of nostalgia right of like connecting ourselves to our ancestors mm -hmm. and and practices such as this where we wrap food in it Mm -hmm. And then put it in and let, let it cook over a slow, mm -hmm. slow clean cook over amber. So obviously it's a tradition mm -hmm. that's still enjoyed by many. Yeah. Including my parents. Yeah. <laughs> my father still. Yeah. I bet it recipes. tastes so good too. Every I think it does to be honest. Yeah. So as we go further down the garden, um, this is our greeting area. Well, this is where we distribute our uh, our produce of the week. Uh, we we receive donations from the local Whole Foods. So we distribute some protein that it's a, that's donated eggs, dairy, stuff like that, okay. uh, bread, which kind of nicely um, complements the produce that we give away as well. Um, here we have hydroponic towers. Um, and so a hydroponic tower is basically has a reservoir of about 30, 40 gallons of water where we mix in a liquid fertilizer, like, like worm castings, we, uh, traditionally, it's used with chemical fertilizers, but we try to do a combination of like worm castings, and we're still trying to figure out the right recipe for the right crops. But the current recipe for our current crops seems to be working well for stuff like mints. Mm -hmm. This is sort of like a lemon burbain type of mint. Mm -hmm. um, too bad you don't have smell of vision because this does smell awfully great. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, thyme, you know. And so with these, what are the pros and the cons of using them for gardening? So, so depends on how you, I, I see it more as a pro mm -hmm. for people who live in, in the urban areas where soil might be contaminated mm -hmm. or it's not accessible, you know? Mm -hmm. Land being such a, um, at such a high cost anywhere in the city, mm -hmm. especially here in Los Angeles, that most people don't have access to land to grow their own food or supplement you know, nutritious food. Mm -hmm. And so, this is a good alternative. Uh, the, the, originally, when they first came out to the market, they're fairly expensive. They come down in price significantly. Mm -hmm. But, so what happens is, is there's this uh, reservoir of uh, water and nutrients, mm -hmm. and it gets pumped up here. When it reaches the top, it cascades down. And as it cascades down, it, it, it basically it it keeps the the pot moist. Okay. And so as you can see, this is a parsley. It's a fairly good looking parsley. You know, it looks pretty good. It tastes great. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so it, it basically every hour it comes down for about ten minutes. Okay. And so that's the process by which it, it's watering the plants. Mm -hmm. And it it. Um, Things grow about two to three times faster than in soil. Now, in the soil, you have a more complete nutrition profile for your plant because the soil has everything you need, right? Mm -hmm. And so it's all the microorganisms in the compost that we feed the soil mm -hmm. that are extracting that from the mineral, the, from the rocks and mm -hmm. stuff and feed it to the plant. So when you grow organically, you really are getting a, a nutrition dense produce or nutrition dense food right like our ancestors did with they used to use compost and and other other forms of organic matter mm -hmm. with this since it's not complete right mm -hmm. you're getting food it is nutritious it does have the nutrients but it's not a complete nutritional profile mm -hmm. so you will be you most likely will lack a lot of the um, trace minerals mm -hmm. that you know you don't usually get when you grow organically mm -hmm. but given if you're already used, eating like non-organic stuff that's grown in a non-traditional way out in these large agro-businesses, those foods are not, don't have a complete nutritional profile because they're right. using chemical fertilizers right. and stuff like that. Exactly. So it's, 
uh, it's probably at one or two levels above that, mm -hmm. but not as complete as something like if you come over here. Mm -hmm. and follow us, please. So, as so there are the hydrogen powers don't have a complete nutritional profile with all the trace minerals that you know that you have in the soil already mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. but it's not not nutritious it's, it's actually much better than what you get at the market anyway mm -hmm. but when you grow it using compost and other organic matters and as you could see we even throw in stuff like eggshells for calcium the soil is brimming with lice and it see see uh, this soil look at all that life Mm -hmm. Look at all that life. Oh, yeah. All these critters and all the other bacteria and stuff in the soil are extracting all, all those trace minerals that we lack in our food today are being basically extracted and fed to our plants. And look at look at this. Uh, so this is rue. Look how beautiful and dark it is, right? It's a very healthy rue plant. If you look at the under leaf, there's no, there's no signs of like disease or anything like that. We try to... Instead of growing something and taking everything out and then restarting again, mm -hmm. we try to do things in stages for companion plants. Okay. We'll, you know, we'll have like the herbs with something like the cucumbers, right? Mm -hmm. Most, a lot of herbs produce this sort of like scent that kind of wore off past two. Now, rue is one of them. If you were to take this rue, crush it, it has this really pungent smell, right? For us, it's pungent when we crush it, right? Mm -hmm. But for uh, for pests and other insects, as soon as they come close to it, they smell that scent, and for them, then it's, it's it wars them away. Mm -hmm. So that's like the beauty of companion planting is we have certain things like herbs, like herb like rue and basil, that are good companions because they have these scents mm -hmm. that for us are, are in many cases are really like intox intoxicating scents, but for pests are not, right? Mm -hmm. So. This was used to be an artichoke. Like, the, oh, wow. Like, like this one. Oh, wow. But since we didn't harvest the artichoke, so it sort of opened up into this beautiful flower. So this beautiful um, purple flower. Mm -hmm. so, so this is, will become a bouquet of this beautiful purple flower. So hence, I only have one or two, right? Because then they get fairly large and this is beautiful. And they stick around for about a good three to four weeks. Mm. And after this beautiful purple flower sort of dies out and right? In the middle of it, there's a seed. Mm. So, so th at, there are different stages you could eat the artichoke when it's ready. And this, this is an example of something that is ready to be consumed. Mm -hmm. right. It's just the right size. It, start, it hasn't started to open yet, so it's probably at its prime. This one, on the other hand, is bigger, but the leaves are starting to open. Mm -hmm. And as the leaves start to open, the seeds start to develop where the heart normally is, the artichoke heart is. But if you don't consume your artichoke, mm -hmm. then it becomes food for the pollinators, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So either you're harvesting it when it's at its prime for ourselves, and we did, we did quite a bit of them, right? But we also leave one or two for the pollinators. And when it, in about three weeks, this will become something like this. Mm -hmm. And then another three weeks later, we'll be ready to harvest the seeds. We'll have some new crops going on here. Okay. As we walk further down, please watch your step, it's not even ground. And so, how long did it take to get all the beds constructed? Uh, it took us about a year. Uh, okay. We did it, uh, given that we, you know, our resources are limited, and you know, we we really uh, ninety percent of the labor is really volunteer labor. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so it took a little while, but. It also allows to really see and, and wait for the soil to develop. Mm -hmm. And so we have the most nutritious soil, mm -hmm. which means we have better out, better crops, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but in the meantime, we also, we're planning other things like, you know, so we have this fence. Mm -hmm. The fence runs from here all the way to the end of where that, like the, that electricity post pole is. Okay. That's roughly 120 feet, 100 feet roughly. Okay. So it's 100 feet by roughly maybe 10 feet. Okay. And at every post, we put in passion fruit. Oh, wow. So every one of these posts has a passion fruit plant. Okay. In some cases, this one over here 
as you can see it's really taking quite off right some are growing faster because the soil so in the areas where the soil is a bit richer mm -hmm. then they're not growing as fast oh, okay in areas where the, the richest the soil is slightly richer you know more amendment was added right and it has more uh, uh, like a more constant supply of water then look how how look the difference is about three times the size okay and so besides mulch what would you recommend to make the soil more richer compost just compost? organic matter okay you know organic matter and and, and uh compost can tame all the life mm -hmm. that leads to good soil okay because the soil whether it's dormant mm -hmm. or whether it's alive mm -hmm. everything it needs it's already there mm -hmm. you just need that that secondary agent Mm -hmm. to extract it people say that we then when we're adding fertilizer mm -hmm. to compost to the soil that we're feeding the plants mm -hmm. we're not feeding the plants we're we're feeding the soil right and we're feeding the bacteria in the soil right that's extracting the minerals from all, from the soil to feed the plants okay so essentially we're growing bacteria and feeding the bacteria that in turn feeds the plants okay yeah that's amazing yeah it is yes. so it's, <laughs> When I first heard of that, I go, it's just gonna yes, it, it yeah. blew my mind a couple years yeah. back. Yeah, it's just um, nature, nature, nature. Yeah. That's all you need. So eventually we'll have, as you, if you see down, the, see how it slowly, this this long fence mm -hmm. is gonna slowly fill up with this uh, passion fruit yeah. vine. Passion fruit oh is very God. nutritious. It's expensive too. Mm -hmm. I actually, I, I love passion fruit. So this is one of the reasons why I wanted mm -hmm. the passion fruit here instead mm -hmm. of maybe grape or mm -hmm. other stuff. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, if you go out to the market and you want to buy a passion fruit, it's like mm -hmm. five dollars a fruit. Yeah. Here we have the capacity to grow, uh, you know, hundreds of mm -hmm. pieces of fruit that we give out for free to the community. Yeah. You know what? Yeah. And at the same time provide an evergreen wall that gives residents their privacy mm -hmm. you know yeah. since this space was vacant for over 50 years these folks have privacy for the longest time now that we're here so i'm sure that they would appreciate you know some privacy mm -hmm. so by creating green walls that produce food mm -hmm. you know it's a win-win for yeah them that's for us. that's very considerate yeah. um so along the periphery the fence and all around the property we have we have uh fruit trees these happen to be apples and then this is a strawberry field? Yes, a strawberry patch. Oh, wow. Um, and so are the poppies companion guarding as well? Guardian? The poppies were our uninvited guests, but oh. they're still the beautiful uninvited guests. So they don't do any damage for the no. strawberries? No, no. They're, they're not. Okay. And the poppies are coming to the end of their life cycle. Oh, they are. And so, you know. How can you tell? So see how this particular, like right here in particular, the the uh, the flower petals have already dropped off uh, and see this part right here mm -hmm. this portion right here from here where my this here mm -hmm. is the seed pot oh. so in this area right here in here when it dries out mm -hmm. there's there the seeds are going to develop oh, and then so. when the wind comes it's going to scatter the seeds all over the place <gasps> And then come next spring, mm -hmm. they're gonna just kind of magically appear wherever the seeds landed. And where, what is that called? Um, I guess self self germination. I mean so, self. Um, well, not self germination. But what's it called? Um, seed dispersal. Okay. <laughs> I don't have the right word right now. Okay. But yeah, okay. They, they they basically um, it's a form of, of them propagating themselves. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Kale here. That is. Looking look! Look at that! Very amazing. Look at this dark amazing, green, amazing, right? Amazing. You know what I mean, I love it. And and residents can come here mm -hmm. and harvest their own kale. You know, you come and harvest a couple of leaves. You know, you harvest a good 10, 20, 12 leaves. Yeah. And that's what a proportion of would be in the supermarket. Yeah. I mean, this is a kale that I just freshly picked myself. Mm -hmm. So it's most nutritious. It's the most nutritious right now because it hasn't started to decay. Or, yeah. All right. By the time you get kale at the supermarket, it's been a day or two yeah. since it was picked. Here, our residents come and pick it themselves mm -hmm. when, and, and cook it literally like minutes after they pick it. Yeah. And, I mean, look at how beautiful that is. Yeah, that we're, is stunning. We're growing also different kinds of kale. So this is a red Russian kale here. Okay. But uh, look at the leaves to this. At the supermarket, yeah. the leaves tend to be sort of like Smaller. this. Yeah. But I mean, it's such the soil is so rich. Mm -hmm. Look at the leaves. So this is a red Russian kale. Mm -hmm. We grow about three different 
types of kale here. Okay. These are the three more popular varieties mm -hmm. that we grow because they're in high demand. Mm -hmm. Our spring activity, we had a spring strawberry festival where we planted a strawberry patch with the kids. We had strawberry tasting. We made strawberry lemonade. Oh. And we had face paintings and bunny time. That so we planted amazing. that here. And by luck, right in the middle, there's this beautiful native poppy that is growing. Yes. And then how often do you guys have uh, events like that? We have weekly workshops that okay. are free mostly on Saturdays. We have a calendar on our website at growinghopegardens.org that uh, has the calendar of our workshops. I think we have a pruning one coming up this Saturday, uh, soil composting health one. The following. everyone i hope you're all having a beautiful day i am here with eric he is an intern that works at growing hope's garden you yeah, can go ahead and introduce yourself and tell us you know what your favorite thing is about the garden how you got into it you know what inspires you yeah well um i can talk about how i first got here but i used to live at the lgbt youth center in hollywood and they do employment opportunities there and I had like many options to pick through with internships. There's mm -hmm. like various, like working at a cafe, mm -hmm. working at a garden. Mm -hmm. And I was kind of drawn towards gardening because I, I remember in high school, I had a little bit of a passion for mm -hmm. gardening because mm -hmm. I had like a little garden in my backyard. Mm -hmm. And I thought it could be really peaceful for me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I also like re recently like lost a friend at the time, so I thought, I'm so sorry. yeah, thank you. Uh, I lost, and we lived together at this this shelter in Hollywood too, another shelter, uh, the Covenant House. And I thought uh, Growing Hopes could help me uh, get connected and grounded mm -hmm. uh, with my grief. Mm -hmm. So that's also the main reason why I wanted to join Growing Hopes Garden mm -hmm. is to uh, help with grief and then also just be at peace with nature and it's it definitely has so far and that's how i came to growing up's garden and my favorite thing about this place growing up's garden is definitely the people there's a sense of community here mm -hmm. and um i definitely worked on my communication skills here because uh, we get to talk to um, volunteers and um people at the farmers market in santa monica and then um, we talk to like just any like neighbors that just come by and you know uh, get any food here. Oh, that yeah. is amazing. We do a lot of food dis uh, dis distribution. Dis distribution. <laughs> not me not knowing how to pronounce words. But yeah, we do a lot of uh, food distribution here. Okay. And then we like, like pack up food in a little box. Mm -hmm. And then we, uh, uh, it's all organic. Uh, vegetables, mm -hmm. fruit, and we we'll pack it up in a box and mm -hmm. then people come by and uh, um, get the fruit and the food and stuff. And we also like get donations from Whole Foods. Yeah. So we like mm -hmm. pack that up too and mm -hmm. give it to people who mm -hmm. come by to grow help this garden. That is amazing. So yeah, I love giving, being able to help give food to people. Yeah. So yeah. yeah. Do you have a favorite herb or fruit? I tasted the tomatoes mm -hmm. like just amazing yeah. like it was so sweet yeah i i love lavender and sage we have sage and lavender plants around mm -hmm. here mm -hmm. and we also have like various gardens around santa monica mm -hmm. and we grow mugwort mm -hmm. and uh, rosemary and some of the uh other gardens that we have around santa monica mm -hmm. and i'm sure oh wait we also have around la in general we mm -hmm. have it in south la mm -hmm. we have it in north hollywood we have like a at, at this like senior living facility mm -hmm. we have a garden there there's a lot of like there's herbs everywhere yeah. and like the main focus of growing hopes is um to feed people mm -hmm. or to uh it's just edible yeah edible things that you can eat yeah. yeah that's the main focus so definitely my favorite is sage and lavender I that love is those. amazing oh hello again you again from 
Growing Hope Gardens and uh, thank you for visiting us. I hope that this tour was insightful and maybe inspirational even. Um, so in addition to this quarter acre here in Santa Monica, we do have other sites. We have uh, 12 other sites that we steward. They're not as big as this. They tend to be as small as maybe um, 200 square feet or so, but maybe five or six raised beds to as many as maybe 25 uh, raised beds. Some are in rooftops. Some are on people's sort of like, what might be the size of a backyard. But no matter how big or small, I think the, the purpose of projects such as Growing Hope Gardens to raise, um, showing people how to raise food is it's not about that we want to, um, let me take that back. So really the, what these programs really, really outline and really make sense in my, from my own personal perspective is that growing your own food is not necessarily cheaper but it, it is more beneficial in the sense that you are able to grow your own food and harvest the food when it's best, when it's most nutritious. As soon as you cut that piece of produce crop from its plant, right? It starts to decay and this nutrition value starts to drop. When we get our food, even if it's organic at Erewhon, Whole Foods, your favorite organic produce place, by the time we get to it, it's been two or three days. By the time we consume it, it's gonna be another two, three days. And so by then it's no longer that's most nutritious. But when you have the satisfaction of, as we did back here, harvesting, harvesting your own kale and consuming it literally minutes or a couple hours later, it's at its most nutritious. The amount of nutrition is maybe three to five times more, right? Because it's not, there hasn't been decaying for the last couple days. Also, it connects us with the process of the people and the resources when we grow food. If most people knew that it takes 120 days for a, a tomato plant to bear fruit, right? When they buy tomatoes at the supermarket, they, they wouldn't maybe just toss them after they look a little bit funky, right? Because when you think about 120 days to grow a tomato, the resource, the human resources, the people that grow our food, right? All that is costly. And since we're not connected to the, the food system, it's very easy to just kind of take for granted. So I'm very privileged and to be able to harvest here and take to my family literally the same day. Uh, and then also know that I'm only gonna take with me what we're gonna consume for that next day or two. Because I, like I said, I am blessed in that, in that way. Not many people have the opportunity to to do what I do to uh, show people how to grow their own food, engage them, learn from them. Because people come from different parts of the world with their favorite crops and the stories that come with those crops. And so I'm constantly being educated and taught the, the beauty of the system of food that most of us don't have access to in, in this particular manner. And so I'm constantly being reminded that, okay, I'm only gonna take what I'm gonna use because if I take more, it might end up in the landfill or in the compost pile, and I don't want that. I wanna be able to honor the people who grew my food and and appreciate the time they spent and the resources spent to grow my food. And that is, at the end of the day, what these programs really uh, expose to us, right? It, they're, they reconnect us to the food system. And I think as, as if we all had that sort of like experience, then we would see the culture slowly change and instead of having 20 to 30 percent of our food ending up in the land waste, maybe it'd be like two, three percent. And so I really thank you, uh, all of you who are watching this, and I hope to have some sort of inspiration. And, uh, and speaking of inspiration, um, once someone once said that things like food, shelter, medicine should be a human right. And yes, we need to ask the, our leaders in our cities, our towns, our states and countries to make that a priority. Shelter, medicine and food, and not just food, good food, right? Should be a human right. That's something that we should struggle for. And again, thank you.